Welcome to the final episode of season 16 of ECCB Connects. If a hurricane or any other natural disaster should strike, are you financially prepared to protect yourself, your loved ones, and your assets? We discuss this important issue on this episode. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank is rolling out DCash, the next step in the evolution of the EC dollar. Use DCash to send and receive money to and from friends and family. Make payments directly from your smart device. Make payments from wherever you are. Download the app from the Google Play or Apple Store and sign up or visit DCashEC.com for more information. The future of the EC dollar is digital. Let's make history together. connected. We're in the heart of the Atlantic hurricane season. While we take steps to protect our properties from the impact of disasters, it is also important that we prepare financially in the event a disaster strikes. Brenton Hilaire, Agency Manager of Sales, Sagicor Limited, Dominica, is here to discuss this important issue. Brenton, welcome to ECCB Connects. Thank you for having me. You have witnessed firsthand the devastation of Hurricane Maria in Dominica, and you've seen how some people have struggled to, to rebuild. How important is it to have a financial plan in the context of natural disasters? In this day and age, I don't think anyone is able to wing it because there's a saying that goes, if you fail to plan, then you're planning to fail. And what tends to happen is that during a natural disaster, you go into a sort of reactive mode where it's pure adrenaline and your thoughts are sort of swayed in a particular direction that it's accustomed to. And if you have not really planned properly, the direction that it's been swayed to might not necessarily be the right one. And that is what tends to happen when you don't have a financial plan in place that you have been looking at regularly. Because a financial plan will remind you about your budgets, where you have a little wiggle room, where you have your savings, where you have some cash on hand, all these things. Because they're supposed to come naturally during a natural disaster because you don't have time at that point to really sit down and try to think and analyze and search. It's supposed to be at the top of your head and you just go into that form of action. Let's look at insurance. What are some of the insurance tools that are available that people can use to protect themselves and their assets? There are so many different kinds of insurance. I mean, it all goes back to the risk. I will always say that. Yes, we have different products, but within your capacity, you have to assess where the biggest risk lies and you focus on that risk first before going on to just capturing everything. So in terms of the different products we have, we have one aspect which we call life insurance and that's the one I believe most people know of. And that's basically in a case where, God forbid, if in that natural disaster, you had to pass away, then you'd want to know that the family members in your household who depend on you financially have that financial support to continue in your absence. And people often try to say that during a natural disaster, after natural disaster, is when they should cut off some expenses. Yes, that is true, but insurance should not be a part of that expense, especially for life insurance, because we go through a sort of financial challenge during that period when the income is limited. And now you have to tell yourself, in this current state, given the fact that my income is limited and I'm doing my best to make ends meet, if I had to disappear, I was already in a financial challenge. So how is my family going to cope with now 0% of my income? So that definitely is not an expense that you would want to cut, cut off. And it goes back to having that financial plan in place knowing where you can maneuver and wiggle. So life insurance will help your family have a financial support in your absence. That is worst case scenario, God forbid, the natural disaster took you off this earth. 
you have the other aspect of health insurance, because in some cases, it could have been an accident that occurred during the natural disaster, and then you have to now look for access to treatment to return back into a position where you can be healthy or resume working when that time comes. So health insurance caters to that risk of the delay in recovery. And in terms of property, we have house insurance, we have content insurance, we also have motor insurance. Now, these three different products would not necessarily be required by every citizen, but one way or the other, every citizen has to assess the situation to see where the biggest risk lies. Because someone renting, for example, might say, I don't have to think about property insurance altogether because it's not my house. But the fact remains that a lot of us furnish our apartments. So we buy those 55 inch TVs, we buy those nice couches and that came at a cost. And I can speak from the experience of Hurricane Maria in Dominica. When those rivers overflowed their banks, they went into those apartments and they destroyed everything. So though the property is not yours and that risk did not belong to you, you now have the challenge of, in some cases, taking a second loan for the same things that you had prior. So you're paying twice for something whereas having content insurance would have saved you from that. So all in all, these products are available and we, as a part of our financial plan, have to go through our personal portfolios and see where the greatest risk lies and then put measures in place to address them. From your experience in the insurance sector, what are some of the strategies that you would recommend? So the first thing an individual needs to do or the easiest thing that they can do is just having a conversation with an insurance professional who has been trained to provide that sort of advice and feedback to individuals. So it will help them to navigate the waters of deciding what's right for them. And then goes back to what you said earlier, Having a financial plan also helps you with that approach to the insurance industry. Because, I mean, we as citizens have our own right to make decisions. And in speaking with an insurance professional, if we feel that what they're tell telling us is not in alignment with what we need, having a financial plan will remind us about that. So I'm just going to throw an example here where I'm speaking to a 23 year old, just using an age, and I could take your approach and say, hey, you're 23 years old, you need life insurance, and to the 23 year old, they know their plan. Their plan might be, I have no plans to have any children in the future. I don't want children, which seems to be the common thing these days. So why are you telling me, telling me about life insurance? Now, if that person never went through the process of planning their finances to that extent, they would basically buy anything that was thrown out there. So having your own financial plan, understanding your own goals for life helps you in navigating the waters of assessing the different products and what's the right fit for you. Now we know many people sadly uh, do not learn until after the fact. And you've mentioned briefly uh, the devastating Hurricane Maria in, in Dominica. Are there any financial lessons, you know, which came out of that experience that you can share with our audience? Um, I'll start with the property side first, and then I will get into the health insurance, sorry, the life insurance side. The first is for people who own motor vehicles, you have to maybe start considering getting full comprehensive. There is a notion that if I own the vehicle, I'm not being forced by the bank to get full comprehensive, I can revert to third party. And we know that the premium you pay for third party is significantly lower than what you pay for full comprehensive. And you might tell yourself, I don't have a history of finding myself in any vehicular accident, so I don't have to consider paying that extra money to the insurance company. But Hurricane Maria taught us it's not about being a good driver because many of us were inside of our homes and our apartments and the hurricane did what it did to our vehicles. We had no control over it. We had no say over it. And so I would imagine that for those who only had full comprehensive coverage, they were at a complete loss. So that's definitely something to consider. It's a lesson that we all learned. The second pertains to understanding your coverage. And 
that was a rude awakening, I believe, for some people in Dominica, where, for example, you might have had full comprehensive. I'm using vehicles as an example, but then there is an additional coverage you could get, which would have said act of God. Or there's an additional coverage that you could have gotten, which was specifically for windscreen damage. And what you would find is that every company will have a, the basic, the core insurance product, but in terms of the full way of how they present it to the market might differ from one player to another. And it goes back to what I said earlier about getting to understand who you're gonna get married to. So we have the right and the responsibility to understand the product that we have purchased, understand if there's anything missing from it, if there's any potential add-on to it, so that when the event does arise, that we are fully aware of where we accepted the risk and that we would have to undertake that on our own. The third area, lesson learned for us coming from Hurricane Maria is ensuring that our property is covered for the full amount of the value of the property and the insurance. They have to be married. They have, should be the same. Sometimes, from what I understood in the market, there were cases where people were willingly insuring the property for less than the full value of the property. Reason being to reduce the premium. Now, they did so thinking that reducing the coverage meant that they reduced the total payout that they would get in the long term if something happened. With property insurance, when you, and the word we use is underinsure, when you underinsure your property, it's not that you're reducing the potential payout that you could receive, but you're sharing the risk with the insurance company. So if, for example, your property was 100,000 and you insured it for 50,000, you're not telling the insurance company that you only want to receive 50,000, but you're telling them for any claim that arises, I agree to accepting 50% of that risk based on the ratio. So that's something that we had to spend some time on in terms of educating the public post Hurricane Maria but I still think it still poses a challenge and many may not have fully understood the concept of not insuring their property for the full value. Lesson number four is going back to property insurance and we're speaking about doing regular updates on your property's evaluation. The recommendation is that every three years, you should do an evaluation on your property to understand what the current replacement cost is. And I say current because for many who do not know, the cost of construction is increasing every year. So the cost of the material, the cost of the labor increases every year. And as a result, the cost of replacing your property increases with every passing year. So if you had insured it when it was initially 100,000, to reconstruct that same property in three years might cost 150,000, just using figures. And that's why it's important to do that updated evaluation so that you can make sure that your insurance level matches the current cost of replacement of your property so that there isn't this sharing of risk that I spoke about previously. Another lesson learned is using life insurance as a sort of backup. Now, the traditional life insurance, a lot of people think about it. They still, I still hear it, they call it death insurance, but that's just one side of it. There are policies that we call cash value policies which allow an individual to access funds on their policy after a certain number of years. Now, the reason why I included that in it as a lesson learned is that we all know that within your own financial plan, you need to have what you call your savings or your emergency fund. That has to be a part of it. That's a must. And you are going to need those emergency funds directly after the passage of a disaster. Because when things start picking up, your business might still be closed, but you need to have available funds to buy the groceries as soon as possible so that you can remain comfortable. Now with a cash value policy, what it does is it provides you with an additional avenue for accessing funds during that emergency period. 
So you would have your traditional emergency fund and then you would have that backup to the backup. And you know, sometimes it is said that you have your savings, you dip into your savings and you don't put it back, but that cash value actually helps you to become more disciplined than that. So I believe these are five lessons learned that the reader could benefit from knowing if they're not already aware. That's it for this episode and season 16 of ECCB Connects. We'll be on break until September when we'll come back with more exciting programs to share with you who we are, what we do, and how we serve you. Until next time, be sure to connect with us on our social media pages. Music